Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Paul Duncan McGarrity. And welcome to another episode of Ask an Archaeologist with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. And I'm recording this right at the end of the Dying Matters Week here in uh, the UK, uh, which is an event designed to try and uh, promote the idea of thinking about and discussing our own mortality. Um, sort of like in the, the uh, press releases were coming out saying 62% of people haven't even discussed what they want to do for their funerals with their families. And basically just try and uh, discuss it in a more open and um, sort of frank manner. And I'll tell you this, uh, when you are an archaeologist, uh, it turns out uh, people really, uh, you, this is like the one week you're in demand. Uh, I've done about four or five different talks, a couple of uh, gigs as well. Um, it's been really fun. Uh, did one up at Birmingham Museum, that was quite nice. Uh, had a really interesting gig where I had to pick my own uh, playlist for my funeral. And uh, that, that's a weird experience and one that I am pleased to say uh, seemed to go over rather well. Um, if anyone's interested, it's I, uh, If I Should Fall From Grace of God by the Pogues. That's the main one. Um, yeah, it was really fun. And it was, uh, yeah, it was interesting, particularly as... Well, one of the sites I'm working on at the moment is a big cemetery site, um, so obviously that's that means that we, you know, where it just reframes how you are thinking about what you are doing, you know, when it it takes it from um, a normal sort of archaeological excavation to just reminding you that. Uh, what you're looking at are individuals who had families, were loved, and it just reminds you to, you know, to continue to treat them with a level of respect. Um, and it's just nice to get that little reminder every now and again. Yeah, it was it was, a, it was an interesting week. Uh, <laughs> uh, one one that also included me do my favourite pastime, which is walking around an art gallery full of medieval art, uh, trying to identify all the memento moris, all the tiny little skulls that have been placed, just to remind you that one day you too will pass. <laughs> um, which is, I mean, I was going to say there's a morbid way to start a podcast, but no, in the, in the, uh, in the spirit of uh, Dying Matters Week, it is just uh, an interesting point to consider that you are... Uh, that you will one day shuffle off, and you've got to, you know, you've got to make the most of it while you're here. Whether that be uh, uh, gigging in comedy clubs or um, or putting all your thoughts down in a, a surprisingly rambling introduction to a podcast about co- archaeology. Uh, yeah, what should I, I should probably get to who we're talking to this week. We've got uh, Karen Martin Stone, who is an Australian archaeologist. And um, I hope she doesn't mind me saying, but a bit of a dynamo. Uh, she, um, when we started this conversation, I kind of had a bit of an inkling of, of the sort of things that she did, but I didn't realise how uh, how much of a, a self-driven person she seems to be. Um, she's certainly someone who, who is, uh, to my mind, making the most of the life that she has. And um, being rewarded by uh, getting to go out and do some really interesting and awesome things. Uh, yeah. So, um, oh, I've just seen on Twitter as well, literally just uh, just popped up. Um, we've got a, a sort of a, I've been tagged in on quite an interesting um, archaeological discovery that's coming out of um, Mexico. Uh, or the Gulf of Mexico, rather, and it seems that there's um, some marine archaeology taking place there, which are, again, based around a burial site that seemed to have been in a freshwater pond um, prior to the Gulf of Mexico rising and, and, and completely submerging the site. 
Yeah, it looks like they're doing some really interesting work. It's one of those things with uh, marine archaeology. They say it in the article that I've been linked into. And, and thank you to IM, uh, IWM21 on Twitter for the, the link. Um, they say in the article, you know, it's interesting that uh, marine archaeology only 10, 15 years ago was, pre- you know, uh, so heavily preoccupied with uh, looking for sunken vessels, looking for shipwrecks. Um, and now they're, you know, in, in more recent times, they're spreading out into looking at a wider variety of archaeological sites. They're, 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 they're not just specialising in, you know, transport stuff. They're finding these. Uh, these occupation sites and um, yeah so I think off the back of that uh, I'm going to try and pin down a, a, a marine archaeologist for a chat because it'd be interesting to see it sounds like it's it's a, a very dynamic time in their particular field and I'd be interested to see what's going on over there so again thanks very much for the heads up IWM uh, also Miss Allison uh, again on Twitter uh, Thank you for getting in touch. Um, she says uh, she was listening to Ask an Archaeologist and it gave her an idea for a community project with a parish church. Anything where people are hanging out around old buildings, I fully endorse. And uh, yeah, if there's anything I could do to sort of help or assist in anything like that, drop us a line because I'm always willing to see if I if I am available to help or, or give any advice or, you know, Get involved, actually. If the if, if you're going to go and hang around in an old building, you know that I will be there. Uh, so, yeah, just drop me a line. And you can do that on at Ask an Arc. Many of you already follow, but if you're new to the podcast, hello. Um, that's the best way of getting in touch with me is through Twitter. Uh, please, uh, also, if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, rate it, review it, all the usual stuff. Um, but as I've always said... The best way of making sure that this podcast reaches uh, people who are interested in it is by a personal recommendation. Some of you I know have been doing that. And again, thank you very much. It is really appreciated. And I keep bumping into some of you as well, um, turning up to my gigs, which I know it's happened loads now. And I've said it on the podcast before, but every time it happens, I am genuinely surprised to see people in the real world turning up to things. So again, thank you very much. Right, I think that's quite enough waffling from me. Um, we're going to get into this uh, really interesting interview. Uh, obviously, as she was an Australian archaeologist, this one has been recorded over Skype. Um, we had a few connection issues. I've tried my best to edit around them. If there are any sound issues, um, I mean, I hope I'm getting better. <laughs> I'm still trying to, you know, I'm self-taught editing and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so... Uh, I think I do. I think I've done all right, he says, before actually editing it, uh, recording the introduction before he's edit, done any of the work. But hopefully, I managed to pull it off. Um, but if not, my apologies. Uh, I hope you enjoy the podcast. Let me know. Get in touch. Anything you want to talk about, please. I'm, I'm always willing to have a chat. And uh, yeah, look after yourselves. And I'll catch you next time. Uh, enjoy the podcast where with uh, Karen Martin Stone. I'll see you later. Bye. Everyone was saying it was a dinosaur, and I thought, great, archaeologists to dig up dinosaurs, which is that hairy old chestnut. <laughs> right. Which took a long time to learn was not the case at all. But, uh, yeah, so I always knew it was possible and interesting and local. And then, yeah, I went through all of the usual adolescent career crises of what am I going to do. And I did something most people don't do. I got kicked out of school when I was 16 for being pregnant. Oh, right. And so I now have a daughter who's who's 25, <laughs> and, yeah, I became a mum and had to think seriously about what work I would do and still had no idea. I started working in a school and assistant for students with disabilities and thought I'd study teaching, but doing study off campus, you couldn't study education directly until second year. So I did archaeology subjects in first year uni as filler oh. <laughs> and then couldn't do anything else. <laughs> Yeah, it was just what I wanted to do. That's fantastic. So basically it found you, essentially. 
Essentially, yeah. It was always something that I found interesting mm. and then couldn't couldn't escape. Brilliant. Oh, well, <laughs> you make it sound like a horrifying uh, sort of <laughs> nightmare scenario. <laughs> oh, it locked me in a basement until I loved it. <laughs> oh, awesome. Almost, yeah. <laughs> that was very difficult, but it was it was very rewarding. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So what was your sort of, uh, I mean, this is an unusual route in, what was your first uh, experience of professional life in archaeology? Oh, um, my professional life started in consultancy or commercial archaeology, as you call it in the UK. And the, I was, during my undergraduate studies, I was working as a database manager for a consultant botanist. And he'd bought with his wife a block of land that they intended to turn into a conservation area. So they wanted a baseline heritage survey. Yeah. So I did did that with um, someone who'd just finished their honours degree as well. And so that was my first taste of going out into the wild bushland and seeing what you can find. And that was quite fun. And so since then I've worked in museums and and also in archives when I was looking for town-based work and then for the last 10 years almost been full-time back into consultancy. And I, I run a consultancy firm that covers the whole Northern Territory. Oh, wow. Wow. So what, um, what sort of work do you undertake in, in the Northern Territory? What are the, the areas that, uh, what kind of sites are you, are you investigating? There's, I guess, three kinds of sites in the Territory. There's, uh, or four maybe, Indigenous and Macassans, which I'll detail shortly, Historical from the colonial period onwards, and Maritime, lots of shipwrecks, etc., and plane wrecks in the sea. And so I don't tend to touch the Maritime stuff, but I do look at Indigenous, Macassan and Historical and so uh, Australia's Aboriginal people have been living in the Territory for at least 65,000 years and all of their heritage, or all of the archaeological material relating to Indigenous occupation is automatically protected by the, the laws that we have. Same, same for Macassan heritage. The Macassans were a fishing culture that came down from Southeast Asia, modern day Indonesia, across the northwest coast of Australia. They'd come down seasonally and fish for tree pang, which is a sea cucumber. Ooh. And, and I- yeah, and other goods as well. I think for about 400 years and they traded with Aboriginal people. And there are some wonderful stories of um, men and women going back to Southeast Asia from the top end and then coming back and um, bringing all sorts of different cultural influences to the territory as well. Right. So there were families in both cultures and it was a fairly peaceful trade as far as we can yeah. tell. And then, and then Europeans arrived and it hasn't been so peaceful since. No, 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 we've got that. That's, 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 I mean, mm. if, if we had an MO, that would be it. Yeah, yeah. essentially. Everything, everything seems rather nice around here, but I, I think you need more borders. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, and so there are a few historical settlements. There were three settlements from the British across the north coast, uh, Port Essington, Fort Wellington and Fort Dundas. And then there was an early settlement from Adelaide, South Australia, uh, which is the state just south of the Northern Territory, if that makes sense. Yep. <laughs> um, they, they were our colonial superpower when the Northern Territory was established. It was the Northern Territory of South Australia in the early 1860s. So they sent up a party of men to set up a, an establishment called Escape Cliffs. And it died a death very quickly because they weren't prepared for the environmental conditions. We're very remote and very extreme up here. We, it's a wet, dry tropics. So six months of the year it's hot and wet and six, the other six months it's hot and dry. Ooh. And yeah, and we have incredibly uh, rugged landscapes and lots of things that will kill you, like crocodiles and snakes and jellyfish and things. Cool, cool. <laughs> yeah, so so that's where I work, <laughs> escaping the crocodiles and the buffalo Should, and the wild horses. I, I don't things. think I'm going to moan about being rained on on a site again. <laughs> <laughs> great thing is that I generally don't work in the wet season so you can go out for six months and know that you're not going to get rained on. So as you have a consultancy what is the the kind of the driving funding force for archaeology in Darwin? 
Generally, it's private development. So we had quite a mining boom in Australia from about 2004 to 2014, and then that tapered off, and it seems to be bouncing back a bit now in line with um, oil prices on the international markets. And so that we have minerals exploration and then um, mining production. So exploration drives a lot of what I do. If someone is planning, if a mining company is planning to explore for more minerals, they'll have plans for where they want to drill holes. I go out first and say, well, I've found these heritage sites. You can't go here. You can't go there. And if it gets to the point where they go into mining production, which takes years, if not decades, then they'll they'll have narrowed down the area where they want to look and you can also apply for permits to disturb archaeological sites and that's when you'd go into salvage. But more than 95% of the work up here is um, survey and document and recommending avoidance. Mm. I also pick up some jobs through construction industries. So I've done a really interesting project in Darwin City in the last couple of years where a luxury hotel is going in uh, very close to the site where the original camp was that set up our city in 1869, so it's 150 years ago now, and that's been sort of the centre of a lot of events happening, including um, the Navy taking over the port in World War II. We were bombed quite heavily through World War II, mm. and, yeah, there's lots of yeah. interesting things there. We have that crossover. Uh, we have that, oh, no, we're, we're going to have to look out for bombs. Yes, exactly. UXO. Well, we get a UXO specialist in, and so a lot of the areas where I've worked, uh, or where I work these days, have already been surveyed by the unexploded ordnance person. And for example, the waterfront job, the hotel one that I did, they had come in and said that there was like a point two percent chance that you would find some unexploded ordinance in this area and apparently the insurance company said well that's not zero and so they <laughs> <laughs> they insisted it's weird about bombs people are so weird about bombs if, if, i mean if there's a small yeah. chance of finding bombs people are worried about bombs oh they absolutely are and so they because there was that very tiny chance of finding uxo he had to be on site for all ground disturbance work yeah. so that if something came up that looked like it might be he had to certify whether it was safe or not and that was from my perspective quite great because mm. i don't know enough about whether the ordinance is live or not or potentially live yeah. to be able to safely say don't put your bulldozer there <laughs> uh, and there have been instances in the Territory decades ago where earth-moving machinery has hit yeah. um, some underground yeah. uh, ordnance and had a bit of a boom. Uh, so no one has been killed, thankfully. Look at you. Um, I, I, a long time ago on a site, I had uh, like an older sort of um, uh, super, like, you know, gang leader kind of guy. And we saw something and we were like, is that... Is that, uh, is that possibly a bomb and he went over and just booted it and he went well it's not it's not gone off so it carried on <laughs> oh no there have often been people um just fossicking around the territory and they pick up mm. unexploded ordnance and bring it home and use it as a doorstop and it's not until oh someone no knows. <laughs> <laughs> mm, i know there have been a few cases where the cops have been called in to remove it after it's been used for a number of years i love that a chance imagine you yeah. imagine you find out because you've you've had an argument and you leave the house and slam the door and boom <laughs> <laughs> well that was a punchline wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't that angry i'm so sorry <laughs> But um, so, uh, what made what prompted you to start your own consultancy? Um, the, the first time around, it was quite by accident, and the <laughs> second time as well. <laughs> and I, I don't seem to have a lot of direction in life. Do no, I? I think I had think I've got a new title for you: the accidental archaeologist. I've thought of that one. Yeah, that's that's probably going to be my second show for Edinburgh. <laughs> yeah, so I was just finishing my undergraduate degree in 2004 and there was a shortage of archaeologists here as the mining industry took off. And the director of the Heritage Branch at that time rang me and said, there was one other consultant here who would like to meet me and talk to me about consultancy. And I thought, sure, I'll come along, have lunch. So the three of us met. And I thought it was going to be a little bit of an information uh, exchange, but it was really what's your daily rate and when can you start? And I thought, oh, okay, I guess I'll do consultancy. 
Uh, and at that stage, I'd been doing um, contracts at the museum while I, the state museum here, while I was studying, mm. and had no real plans of what came next. Just so that was, very quickly, what were those contracts with the museum? Oh, I started off in conservation, and then I did collections management, and then I did exhibition support. Wow! So, so you've got quite a varied area of kind of um, experience then before you even come out of university. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, it was interesting because at the time I was married and my husband was in the military. So 2004 for the dry season, I did consultancy. And then in February 2005, he was sent to Iraq with the army here. And so suddenly I couldn't do a dry season of field work because uh, my daughter was 10 or 11 at the time and I needed to be in town for her. So that's when I took a 12-month contract to do exhibition support at the museum. And after that as well, while she was still at school, I did three years with the National Archives here doing operations and preservation. So their historical collection is just amazing. It's all uh, Commonwealth Commonwealth Government records related to the territories. So as well as original um, land use documents, there's also all of the interactions with Aboriginal people. And the the White Australia policy you might have heard of already, it was brought in with Federation in 1901. And essentially the government wanted to stop immigration and uh, phase out Aboriginal people for want of a less offensive term, yeah. but essentially that's what it was. And so there were um, schools of thought where they were there was a quote smoothing the ra- the pillow of a dying race. Um, oh, what that was life. a quote. That was a quote. Oh yes. my god. Um, uh, which was <laughs> we're, good, we're good at horrible euphemisms as well, apparently. Yes, yes, absolutely. And then there was um, the stolen generations mm. part of the White Australia policy where young children were stolen from their parents and put into homes for Indigenous people and some were adopted into white families. And so it was a tragic and awful time and still has repercussions to this day. Mm. And the National Archives holds all the Commonwealth Government records from that time frame and so a lot of people think that the government has a file on them that it's in your name and everything goes into that file but that's not how government files are created and so people's names will be listed in other files with odd titles like um i don't know um ramen ginning um whatever um i can't even think off the top of my head and so there was a uh, a report, the Bringing Them Home report in 1997, which was a, uh, an investigation into the stolen generations. And one of the recommendations was to make this information more accessible to people who'd been part of the stolen generation. So, and so you were collating. Pe- it, was it a, when you were saying earlier? It was basically that people's names aren't in one big folder. You just appear in lots of different files, and there's no connection between them. Yeah, exactly. Right. So part of the bringing, bringing them home process was the National Archives employed people to go through these files that were most likely to uh, list activities that resulted in the removal of children and they made a database that um, connected all of the individuals' names to the files within which they mentioned and they set up a service. Um, there was the government-funded link-up service, which I think is still operating today, where people who know that they've... Um, that they or their parents or grandparents were stolen can do their family history research. And so they're put in touch with a counsellor and a research assistant through the National Archives and can find these records and learn their stories. And the link-up agencies, uh, Stolen Generations Aboriginal Corporations, can then organise family reunions when people are surviving. And so this kind of work is immensely um, moving. It's an incredible, powerfully... Um, uh, visceral feeling to be involved in helping people connect with not just their family but with their whole culture that they've lost. Yeah, yeah that, it's that uh, real world, real world application that uh, you sometimes. Yeah, like. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so I'm I'm incredibly lucky in the consultancy that I do. Yeah. Most of it is on Indigenous lands and with Indigenous people, mm. and so. 
um, the exploration happens uh, on Indigenous land or pastoral land. And you might think that a lot of mining companies would be a bit gung-ho, but the clients that I work with have uniformly turned out to be really wonderful mm. organisations that know that if they don't have a good relationship with Aboriginal stakeholders, they will never achieve their goals. Yeah. And so they work together for common goals. And it does Im involve um, creating employment opportunities and other opportunities for Indigenous people on country, which they often don't have because it's such remote areas, as well as protecting culturally sensitive places. Mm. Do you work alongside the Indigenous people when you're on site? <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, wherever possible, I do. Mm. And how do you make the connections there? Is it, you know, how do you start a site and go, let's get people in to work on it? Yeah, usually when the client contacts me and says that work needs to be done, I then contact the Aboriginal Land Council for that area and say who are the nominated traditional owners or custodians for this area. And they'll give me a list of names and I contact them and say, this is what I'm doing, who would be the most appropriate people to come out. And sometimes you're um, walking on country with elders who have all of the cultural knowledge and the stories. Sometimes they're too frail to, to get out into these remote and inaccessible places anymore, so they send young ones along in their stead. And a lot of the places we go to, uh, it's probably hard to describe just how inaccessible they are, but... Often it's take a helicopter, drop us down in there, and we walk out. Wow. Um, and as we go, we record rock art, we record human remains, stone artefacts, scatters, shell middens, all mm. that sort of thing. So it's really spectacular stuff. Yeah, there was yeah. one job that I did over a few years on an island called Groot Island, which is in the Gulf of Carpentaria, it was discovered by Abel Tasman in 1651. Um Oh, not discovered. Aboriginal people were already there. It yeah, was named it, it, by. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. white discovered. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so most of the island is still incredibly inaccessible. And I did the baseline cultural heritage survey of about two thirds of the island. And one um, trip we did was 16 days. Then we had a week off and we went back for another two weeks. And so we took a group of 30 people. It was five hours of four-wheel driving to get to the campsite and so 30 people camping there from the Indigenous community and then there were the anthropologists, myself and my offsider, um, land council representatives, a cook and a camp fieldie and the helicopter pilot. And so then from that point, we were helicoptered into the places each day. So each day we went to a new area and the people that had come into camp were too frail to do the heavy-duty off-trail hiking that we had to do. So for those days, I would be dropped out by a helicopter by myself and my offside would do a se separate area and we would walk all day. Sorry, what, up. the term that you just used is the offsider? Uh, assistant archaeologist. Ah, right. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, come into camp in the evening in the helicopter and uh, show photos and tell the stories of everything that we'd found that day and talk to the traditional owners about how they'd like the sites to be managed or recorded or what it all meant. So mm. um, it was a really fabulous job. And but one of the wonderful things about that too was that while we were out working all day, they were often fishing or collecting food in other ways. And so we had painted crayfish for dinner and turtle eggs and um, all sorts of amazing barramundi and things that were collected while we were working, freshest of seafood. Oh, that sounds amazing. That sounds, I, genuinely, you painted a picture of quite a, an exotic lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was interesting, actually, because after those weeks in the bush and we're driving back in, my offsider turns to me and he's like, oh, I can't wait for a can of Coke or I can't wait for a beer. Uh, what are you hanging out for? And I went, no, I'm good. Yeah. I've just had the best few weeks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I ate seafood that you'd pay lots of dollars for in Sydney. Yeah. And, yeah, it was fabulous. Oh, well, I mean, considering it's a life you, you, you fell into, it's not bad. It's Yeah, I did fall into it, and I'm quite happy with how it's going. And it's interesting because yeah. um, it seems so separate from the world of comedy, which you would probably experience as well. Mm, well, yeah, there's a lot of crossover in mind now. Can we just go back to okay. you were saying about your um, the consultancy the first time? 
so that sounds mm-hmm. like you've had have you opened like been involved in consultancy more than once then yeah so 2004 I did it for the season and then when my husband went to war I stopped doing consultancy for a while and got back into it in 2010 I see and so so between times I was um, doing more museum work and archives work and I had a side light I owned a chocolate business for a year from home a chocolate business I did. I owned a chocolate shop. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, what, what, I, I, I mean, this is an aside, but uh, what was the yeah? You know, what was the the prompt to start the chocolate business? Was it like is that another burning passion? No. Well, I did love chocolate. I put on fifteen kilos. <laughs> <laughs> Why did the business fail? I ate all of the stock. <laughs> I ate the profit. <laughs> No, the driving factor was my husband got back from war. Yeah. We'd been separated for uh, three years of the five and a half years we'd been together mm. cumulatively with his work and mine. So we decided that one of us should have town-based work and that person would be me because his career was more established. And right. so that's why I bought the chocolate business. And, yeah, that went for a year and... By the end of that, he'd been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and couldn't um, continue in the army. Right. And so I went back to museums and archives and he went and lived in a tent in Arnhem Land for two years. So Right. That's hmm, yeah, a bit as different. As a tour, tour guide for rock art. Ah, yeah. that's interesting. He, yeah, he was an archaeologist when we met and then got back into the army, which he had done before I'd met him. I so. see. I couldn't really picture myself as an army officer's wife, but I accidentally became one of those too. I can't wait to see this show. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It kind of sells itself. It really does. I mean, at the very least, you're going to be engaging in the in- interviews beforehand. It's just like, <laughs> and then what happened? <laughs> yeah. Well, then I became vice president of the International Unicycling Federation. Hang on. What? <laughs> <laughs> we'll save that story for another time, shall we? Do you know what? We'll save that one for the show. Like, I, we, we, <laughs> yeah. you, just, you just sprinkle that one on. and Because and, I know there are listeners who go to Edinburgh Festival, and I know that because they've come and said hello to me. Uh, you're coming up in 2020, aren't you? I am. Right. Right. I'm doing a show uh, in 2020 called The Practical Guide to Villainy. It's all about the British Empire, not much about archaeology. So if you're specifically mm-hmm. after archaeology... Come and see KC Martin, and she's going to be doing... Martin Stone. Oh, you KC Martin Stone, sorry. Yes, that's okay. Um, you've, got, you've got so many names. I know, I've dropped the moniker for now. That's a story too. <laughs> you had a moniker because as in... Cause, so let's get into the stand-up comedy as well. When did you start doing that? I started... I accidentally fell into that in 2012. Hmm. And so I've been doing it very occasionally as a hobby and I often say, oh, I'm too busy for this, I have to stop. And then someone says, oh, can you just come and do this one thing and I'll do it. And they say, oh, that was great, can you do the next thing? So I do and it tends to roll on. And then I thought, oh, well, people are actually saying I'm a comedian, I should actually write a show and and start acting like one. So I did my first solo show last year at the Adelaide Fringe, Mm. which was fun. But yes, I'm also kind of accidentally falling into television at the same time. You have your own production company, I believe. Yes, I do, which hasn't produced much at all. But I started out writing archaeology documentaries and travelling to conferences like the World Congress of Science and Factual Producers. And that was a very similar thing where you do something and you pitch it and they say, oh, that's good, can you write the next bit? And as an archaeologist and a comedian who's never done anything in television, I I would fret and go, oh, I don't know how to do it. And I would procrastinate, procrastinate, procrastinate. Then there's a tiny amount of time and I go, oh, help, and just write something that I think is not very good at all, give it to them because the deadline's there. And they say, oh, that's great. Can you do the next thing? And then it just rolls on and on and on. (laughs) And so it seems to be getting very close to something happening there, which, of course, given the TV industry is not something you can ever um, discuss in detail. But it's been very similar to the comedy journal journey. And I really only feel like I found my feet in comedy once I started making comedy about archaeology. Before then, I kept them very separate. Yes. And... 
Yeah, because my business, my archaeology business, is uh, working on projects that are culturally sensitive to Indigenous people. Those aren't my stories to tell. Uh, I worked for companies, so there was commercial and confidence issues. And also because it's my daily bread and butter, I was so used to it that I didn't really think it mm. was that in- interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you forget that it's not a job. Not everyone travels by helicopter to fresh fish. Yeah. I know. <laughs> on a on a remote <laughs> island. And you're like, oh, the nine to five, guys. <laughs> I know, it's such a slog. No, I will not complain. It's really, really fun. But, yes, it does become a little bit routine in the way that you do it. And while each project is different, you um, do, them in, do things mm. in the same way. Mm. So, yeah. So part of the separation, did you use different names when you're doing comedy and when you were doing your archaeology or how did you separate it um i was i did comedy as casey martinstone my real my full name is karen martinstone uh middle initial c and so i've always been known as casey by family and close friends when i was growing up and um people in a professional sense seemed to know me as karen and so when I was published in archaeology, it was KC Martin Stone because I thought if you use your initials, they don't necessarily know what gender you are. So I wanted to avoid any gender discrimination. Ah. And so it's always been much of a muchness. And so with my surname, Martin Stone, that was my married name, and I've been divorced for nearly 10 years now and kept it because at the time... It was just one more thing to deal with that I didn't have the headspace to deal with, and I quite liked Martin Stone more than Martin as a surname. Yeah. And so I kept it, and, and now it feels like a bit of dead weight. And I spoke to my daughter saying, I want to change my last name, but I'm never going to take another husband's name if I ever get married again. Um, I love the fact that her surname is Martin and we're joined by that. Mm. And she said, oh, that's easy. Uh, we'll just both change our names. And I went, wow, would you do that for me? She's like, yeah, we'll just pick a new one. And her name is Phoebe Martin. And after a couple of weeks, she said to me, oh, mum, I've had a think. And actually, I don't want to change my name because my name Spooner rises to Meeby Farton, and I don't want to lose that. <laughs> your daughter, yeah, I your did daughter that sounds amazing. <laughs> she is. She is absolutely incredible. But there you go. There's yeah. something I accidentally gave her a Spoonerized name of Meeby Farton. What's so, her What's her interaction with archaeology? I mean, if she's been raised by a you know a pair of archaeologists, two and archaeologists, and archaeologists herself, yeah, what's her take on it all? It's really funny because from about the age of seven, I remember we went on a family holiday to Tasmania, which has have, has lots of ruins around the place. And Gary and I would be going, "Oh, look at that!" And she's like, "Oh, you archaeologists!" You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so frustrated by it. When she was sixteen, I took her to London. I went, "Oh, look, that's a Roman wall. It's two thousand years old." And she went, "So I've seen twenty thousand year old rock art." <laughs> which is true. Oh, she's an archaeology hipster. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All those teenagers are very dismissive of anything like that. And so it was only over I, the last oh, five years, I guess. She's twenty-five now, where she's just really enthralled by the stories that objects tell. And I think that if there was any suggestion by anyone that she goes to study archaeology, she'd still resist it um, and certainly wouldn't want to follow the family business, as it were. But she loves the idea of uh, objects having stories and places having significance. In December, I was able to take her out on a job with me. Um, I'm doing a rehab project on an old mine site and I've been doing the Indigenous work with the Indigenous stakeholders, and then there's a lot of historical features as well. And I had previously recorded them eight years ago and needed to go back and do a condition check mm. on these. And I said to the client, um, safety in numbers, uh, taking a second person this weekend, do you mind if I take my daughter? Mm. And they said, no, great, that sounds good. And one of the traditional owners went, oh, you have to take her to this place and show her this and show her that. And it was just wonderful for her to come to work with me. I mean, who gets to take their kid to work these days? Yeah. Um, in a place called Rum Jungle. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> where you've got to look out for buffalo and record cool old stuff from mining eras. And um, there was a railway from the late 19th century in the vicinity and some World War Two sites. So, yeah, she thought it was just great fun. Yeah. There's an old drill rig as well that we have to learn the story of. So, All right. yeah, she enjoys it, but I don't think she'd go rushing into a career in it. She's a very independent chick with her own um, thoughts and plans and dreams. So I wouldn't ever push her into it. No. But, of course, I'd be secretly proud yeah. if she did. <laughs> Um, the story stuff that you're talking about, the stories of objects and place, um, how mm. well can you put those over to someone through a television program, do you think? I think it's really tricky for a number of reasons. And so um, the primary reason is what broadcasters are interested in in terms of the narrative. They like stories about discovery and they like um, ancient secrets yeah. and things. And archaeology is much more nuanced. And so if you get a really complex, interesting, sexy kind of a project, yes, you can do it. But everything else is a little bit tricky. And so also one of the things that broadcasters tend to shy away from is anything that has a whiff of worthiness about it. Um, they want something more entertaining. Mm. So, By worthiness, I, we, what kind of thing are we talking about there? Well, I, I worked on one concept that I developed. I was calling it Scientific Suffragettes, and it was a history of women in science, which I thought was great. Yeah. And they, they just went, no, too worthy. <laughs> oh, <ooh. laughs> I know, right? Uh, and so it evolved and it ended up, um, it's still in process, so I can't say too much about it, mm. but um, a comedy panel show about science. Ah, cool. A bit of a different... Mm. So how, that, that's the next thing then. How have you found comedy as a, a, a way, a method of, of carrying your archaeological interest? Um, it's... It's something I've only explored a little bit, and the more I do, the better it goes. So it's certainly something that the general public are interested in. When I did uh, I See Dead People for the first time in Melbourne last month, I hadn't intended to go to the festival, and it was only two weeks before I got there that I found out I had a room to perform in. <laughs> oh, good. That couldn't it fine. Well, I hadn't even written the show at that point. So it, <laughs> Couldn't it very fine? <laughs> yeah, and it had been sitting around in the back of my head. So I did my first solo show February last year in the Adelaide Fringe, mm. and there was a talent scout from the Gilded Balloon from Edinburgh Fringe there, oh, cool. Julia Chamberlain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she came to my show, and there was maybe 10 or 15 minutes on archaeology of dead bodies, and the rest was more about my life. And afterwards she said, can you please write an hour on dead bodies and bring it to Edinburgh? And I said, sure. And <laughs> Right, then, so then it, I got, it's her I need to have a word with. Right. <laughs> and so it's, it's, she's been incredibly supportive. I got very sick. Actually, I was speaking with her this morning. Um, I got sick and ended up having to take four months off work and then mm. I was part-time from July up until around about now. And so... I had this idea for the new show that came out of a question and I'd given it the title and I knew roughly what I wanted to cover, but I hadn't by any stretch of it written it. And so um, the longer I was ill, the more we pushed things back. So I was supposed to be coming to Edinburgh this August right. and I, I was see. supposed to be yeah, debuting the show in Adelaide and Melbourne this year or even last year, September, in Sydney Comedy Fringe. Didn't meet any of those goals. And so um, late March, or second half of March, found out that a room was available mm -hmm. and it was mine if I wanted it. So I got a friend who's a designer to put the relevant details on a poster with a photo of me holding a skull. Um, and that day that all of the design collateral was ready yeah. was the day of the Christchurch mosque shootings. Right. And so I couldn't suddenly go, hey, I see dead people. Um, yeah. And so I thought, yeah. I thought, well, that doesn't, doesn't, that's not funny. Uh, so for, I held off for a week and then there was only a week to go. 
and during which time I was incredibly busy at work with no time for writing the show and starting to stress quite stressfully. Yeah. And I mean, I'm getting heart palpitations just listening to this. <laughs> I take I take two years to write a show. Wow! I took oh, a couple of days. So uh, <laughs> I don't know what this says about us both, or like how good they I are. Don't know. <laughs> well, I was going to say I can't guarantee it's good, but actually, it was pretty good. Good. I filmed it. So, well, I was feeling the pressure because I have a co-production company that we're working on a TV proposal together yeah. and they flew down to Melbourne to film this because a broadcaster wanted to see footage of me on stage. And so I had done two five-minute spots in Adelaide in February and uh-huh. aside from that, no comedy for a year because of my illness. And so I'm like, sure, I can do an hour and film it for the broadcaster. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh no. No pressure. <laughs> I'm genuinely having a panic attack on your behalf. <laughs> so I got to Melbourne. Well, I started marketing the show just before I left Darwin, and within five days it sold out. So a show that didn't exist had fully sold out That's with 20 bucks of Facebook ads. Yeah. And so... I got to Melbourne and went to the venue with the film crew, did the tech run, got it all sorted, going, shit, really got to write this thing. Um, And the illness I've had for the last year or more is constant migraine, Uh, luckily without pain, but what it has is short-term memory loss, language problems, vision disturbances, the sensation of ants crawling on my skin all the time, Mm. all sorts of weird stuff, muscle spasms. And so I woke up on the morning of my show, you're going to hate this, with no functional memory of the show. I couldn't tell you how it started. I couldn't tell you what was in it. Um, I was spastic all down my right side my right arm and leg didn't work properly and I was just an emotional wreck which is also one of the symptoms and so I just kind of had to go yeah well it's happening so what you're telling me is you were in the perfect mindset for comedy great oh ideal yeah so I stressed all day (laughs) all that stress was for nothing great (laughs) I'm ready for comedy who am I (laughs) the surprise thing was, was I got to 7 o'clock that evening and the show was starting at 9.45 mm. and I just went, ah, bugger it, it is what it is, I'll just wing it. Yeah. And not essentially wing it. I had a plan in place for if my migraine completely blanked me mm. um, and so, and then also I had little cue cards that I put on the foldback speakers at the front of the stage yeah. which had a um, couple of word prompts for each bit yeah. of my show but also... There was, there's a thing that I've put together, the six commandments of archaeology, which don't oh. exist as an archaeologist because no. you've never heard of them. But I made them up and they do exist because they are, well, I, I put them in my show last year, in mm. February last year, and a lot of archaeologists came to the show and went, oh yeah, we do do that. Yeah. So great. What, what sort of stuff is this? Is it sort of like, thou shalt always make sure well, there's tea and coffee facilities? <laughs> Not quite, not quite. But the really interesting thing when it came to I see dead people this year was that I had intended to put those six commandments of archaeology in and I couldn't remember them. And so even now I can remember what they are, what they relate to. I can't remember the jokes that go with them and I can't remember the order that I had them in and some of them have callback jokes to previous ones. So you've started recording your sets now, right? (laughs) Yeah, I have. I had it written, but I knew that on the day yeah. there is no way I would remember that slab of information. So I just chucked it out. I did about thirty-five minutes in the end, uh, rather than fifty, which I thought was pretty good going. Yeah, and the audience <laughs> loved it, so <laughs> that was good. Um, uh, so I, I won't give you punchlines and spoilers of no, the show. God, but no, 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 no. If you come in, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, come and see it in Edinburgh. You're going to love it. It's great. Yeah. And so I think part of the mood of that whole show was just um, throw it all in the air and see where it lands. Mm. And that gives an enormous rush of energy mm. and and a playfulness that I really enjoyed. So there was a time in the middle of the show where the stage lights burnt out, and which isn't good when you're filming it. So I said to the crew, should we take a break? And they went, no, no, keep going, keep going. I'm like, okay, let's do it in the dark like teenagers do. Um, (laughs) And 
kind of just rolled on and was really easy and great. So um, that really felt like the first uh, time I'd felt normal since I got sick. Yeah. It felt like uh, I could. I was finally myself again. I could do everything I used to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So onwards and upwards, it's been great. <laughs> so there's still things you wouldn't talk about with regards to archaeology on stage. Oh, absolutely, mm. yeah. Yeah. Mm, I do talk about dead bodies, but um, only ones I'm allowed to. Right. So how do you do? You check any of your comedy, or is it just you've got an internal understanding of what you can and can't say? I have a, I'd say, an internal understanding. I've been hugely interested in ethics my whole career, which has been a massive stumbling block to comedy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've genuinely got a, a contract. I'm doing a, a comedy show at the British Museum in a bit, uh, mm -hmm. and they've sent me a standard lecturer's contract through. And in one of the clauses, is, wow. it says, uh, a lecture will not include obscene material. I'm like, well, that's me. No, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> I'll just see myself out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what you want from me is, hello, good night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And so way back in 2013, I went to the World Archaeological Congress in mm. Jordan and won the ethics debate series there. Wow. And that's been a bit of a cornerstone of my archaeological career because I can say I've built my career on ethics and standards and relationships with stakeholders. Yeah. And so, and I think that is the reason why my consultancy has been successful despite the downturn here mm. um, because it's never been about picking sides or um, just doing it for the money. So I really enjoy that. And it's interesting because when I started comedy, the thing I struggled with the most was truth yeah. because I started out just telling true stories that I thought were funny but actual comedy tells lies <laughs> and I massage I couldn't, is the truth massage is the truth yeah I couldn't give myself permission to do that for a long time because it was editing real stories mm. and inserting a punchline and um, melding characters and all of that and I felt uncomfortable doing it because it didn't sit well with me and then the justification I brought myself to mm. I can tell you I can debate anything was that I start off in telling the truth and I can exaggerate and bend and manipulate that truth to the point where it's lies and even to the audience it's obviously lies. They won't necessarily know at which point it became untrue mm. but the, the, the lies are the funny bit about it. But I can only tell those lies if they tell a deeper truth about humanity. I tend not to use my work cases in my comedy at all um, and so I tend to go into the archaeological aspect of universal themes like death, sex and religion and yeah and then I also bring my um, personal story into that as well so it all because there are lots of ways you can make parallels between archaeology and life and even like throwaway jokes I said the other day, um, I said I was on a date the other day. It was 2017 because that's recent for an archaeologist. And so it just, like, you can just pop little things in there. Um, yeah, I love that side of things because it's making those connections that are unexpected that make it funnier. There are people that will come to a comedy show that would never come to a lecture and would never go to a museum. And so I think that that therefore means there's an obligation on archaeologists to tell the truth on stage. And so it's a bit of a double-edged sword that, that outreach is incredibly important and we need to reach nuances. Because when I started writing archaeology documentaries, the, when I went to the World Archaeological Congress, chaired the session on archaeology in the media and I chaired a debate between documentary producers and archaeologists and the general archaeologist's approach was um, why don't you make a documentary about my PhD thesis um, or alternatively well I've been involved in TV shows before and they completely misrepresented me and there was such a disconnect between the two that I felt there needed to be better ways of doing it and definitely archaeology um, comedy achieves those goals hasn't really taken off yet on screen but you'll see 
things like time team had a very light-hearted element to it and that was all in the team dynamics I think and so that drew a lot of people in and so if you make something smart and funny then I think you're pretty guaranteed to have a decent audience. Okay we're into our last couple of questions now before I let you go so first question uh, mm -hmm. sight cat or sight dog? Sight dog, definitely. <laughs> Team dog. <laughs> and now the last question. You work in the heritage industry, but how would you like to be remembered? Oh, that's really tricky. I'll say smart and funny because it's short and sweet. Um, I don't know how I'd like to be remembered. That predicates having someone to remember me. Um, oh, I'd like to be remembered as someone who accidentally did awesome things is there anything you'd like to plug um i think i'm um, pretty right just my facebook page casey monica sorry no casey martin stone i didn't get to the end of the name story but that's fine um casey martin stone on facebook and k martin stone on twitter all right thank you very much and uh, thank you for joining hey, us. thanks paul it's been a pleasure catch you soon you've been listening to the Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. The music you're listening to was by From the Ashes. Check them out on Bandcamp. It was produced by me, Paul Duncan McGarrity. You can follow me on Twitter at Ask an Arc, or you can send an email at askanarch at gmail.com. But most importantly, if you've enjoyed yourself, if you think you have a friend who might be interested in the podcast, please tell them about it. Write a review, put up a star rating, let people know that we're here. It's incredibly helpful and much appreciated. Once again, thank you to everyone who has asked an arc. Bye-bye. <laughs>